Well, the next thing that dawned on me as I watched those saints walk there, as I looked at them, I could not even tell what they had been in physical life. I couldn't tell if they had been white, black, red, or yellow because spirits are raceless. Just like it says in Galatians, in the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verse 28. There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. I had always known these truths, but was never able to perceive them till the angels brought me to the tunnel and let me look. If you believe God's word, most people don't, goes against tradition, but if you believe God's word, this Bible testifies that when you leave this body, you're going to be ageless, you're going to be sexless, and you're going to be raceless. But you will be the same unique individual there that you are here. You will know and be known you just won't look like there what you look like here. And after all, that, to a lot of us, that's good news in there. <laughs> Did you know you're going to change appearances three times in the course of your existence? You didn't know that? Ephesians, excuse me, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 44, 40 says that there's a difference in the appearance of a physical body and the appearance of a spiritual body. But verse 44 says, as well as having a physical body, you have a spiritual body. So that's your second appearance. You appear first in flesh, second in spirit, third glorified. You're triplet. You're triplets. That's what you are. Flesh, spirit, and glorified body. You want to see Jesus in all three of those bodies? Read John chapter 20, and you'll see him change forms three times in John chapter 20. Been in your Bible all the time. How come you never saw that? <laughs> or have you ever read the book of John? <laughs> if you have, you read it and didn't and missed it. But he said, look at it. When you're looking for it, you'll see it. Changed three times. Well, <clears throat> they took me to the gate of third heaven. You know, this Bible talks about three heavens. Don't talk about a seventh heaven. A lot of people talk about a seventh heaven. There ain't no seven heavens in this Bible. That's in Jewish literature. This Bible talks about three heavens. Third heaven is God's throne room. And they brought me there to plead my case. And I'm ready to go in. The angels stopped me. Said, wait a minute. We brought you to that tunnel to perceive four truths. You saw three. Go back and look again. They brought me back and let me look until 50 saints had been permitted to enter the gates of heaven one at a time. 50 of them. I still couldn't perceive what they wanted me to see. And they came back and told me. They wanted me to be aware of the number of the saints going home. The insignificant number. You remember those two words that I read at the beginning where he said, the broad way to destruction many travel and the narrow way a few be that goeth a few, a few. That's what they wanted me to see, the few. And they said, those 50 saints, had died the physical death. They hadn't died. Their body died. And that body set them free. And they were going home to be with the Lord. Fifty of them. And they said that occurred on August 3rd, 1979, from 4.45 to 5 o'clock, approximating the 15 minutes wherein the paramedic judged my body to be dead until it arrived at the hospital. In that 15 minutes, 50, these 50 saints, their physical body had died. They had been set free, and they had gone home. And then they told me the bad news, that in that same 15 minutes, 1,950 other humans had died, but they went the other way. 50 out of 2,000 made it to heaven. 50 out of 2,000 is 2 and 1 half percent. And then they said, why, I was permitted to see that. On that day, August 3rd, 1979, that was the spiritual condition of the planet Earth. Had that been the day that God had blown the trumpet so loud to wake the dead, he would have found two and one-half percent 
of the planet Earth ready to go home. 97.5 would not have made it. If it had have been August 3rd, 1979, would you have been in that number? Then thank God for his mercy, Amen. not willing that any should perish, Amen. but that all should come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But there is a day, there is a day already appointed beyond which there will be no extension. He brought me back to the gate and let me plead again. If only I came to the gate. At first I said, I'm ready to go and plead my case. He said, no, if you go in, you can't come out. You're going to have to stay there. I said, but if I can't come out, that means my physical life's over. And you told me I could ask him. He said, you can. Stand here. State your case, and he will answer you. Boldly, I came to the gate. No sound in all of heaven save the sound of my plea. Standing outside that gate, I began my plea. And no sound until I finished. When I finished, and only when I finished, did he answer me, the living God, the God that made all of this. The God that made me, the God that made you, the God that is aware of what I'm saying tonight, he answered me in an audible voice. It wasn't a beautiful voice. It wasn't anything like the devil had tried to deceive me with. The voice that he answered me in was described in the 26th chapter of the book of John as thunder. He spoke to me in the sound of thunder. As his voice came down over those gates, before his words reached me, the tone of his wrath had placed me on my face and zapped every ounce of strength in my being as he proceeded to tell me who I was and not who I thought I was. Those two people were not even kin. <laughs> quote, I'm going to quote verbatim the living God. The words I speak here tonight, the words that you hear. If you belong to him, one day you too will stand before him, and perhaps you'll stand before him the day that I give an account of these very words, and you'll be a witness against me. I better be right. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, verse 25, chapter 20, verse, verse 18, chapter 20, he said that the prophets who presume to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak or that should speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. Not may die. He said shall die, indicating spiritual death. I choose very carefully my words when I quote verbatim the living God. I'm going to quote the first part verbatim, actually like he said it to the best of my ability. The rest I'll paraphrase. As he spoke to me, he said, your faith is dead. Your works are in vain. The life that you lived and offered to me as a life of Christian service is an abomination that I rejected in the Pharisees. What made you think I would accept such an offering from a Laodicean type Christian? In fact, untold millions are living the same kind of life that you live. And they stand in danger of my everlasting wrath. Unquote the living God. No, no, Lord, that's not me. Don't you know who I am? I'm a preacher. I'm a teacher. That's not me. Heaven was made of brass. He said he would make turn our heaven into brass. And he did. He wouldn't answer me. As I pleaded. Suddenly a witness spoke. In one word, that witness convicted me. In one single word, I knew it was right. That's the witness <coughs> that Jesus identified in the 12th chapter of the book of Matthew. He said, by your word, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. There they were. Every word I'd ever spoken, every promise I'd ever made to the church, every vow I'd taken, I had somehow broken every one of them. And I had made them with a heart of pure intentions. But over the years, I had broken every one like shattered glass. There they were. Every promise I'd made, every, every word I've ever said, that is me. That's really me. No other witness was needed now. You see, had he reached down, picked me up, and dropped me in hell, 
I would have got what I justly deserved. 